Hello, my name is Philip Koo, and I'm from Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center in Phoenix, Arizona. It's great to be with you all today, virtually, to talk about PSMA, current state of the art, and future vision. So at this meeting, thus far, we've heard wonderful presentations talking about some of the exciting science with regards to PSMA PET imaging and the use of PSMA for therapy. I'm going to take a little bit of a higher level view and talk about sort of the overall current state of the art with regards to the use of PSMA uh, clinically, and also talk a little bit about the future vision of where we might be headed and some of the questions that remain unanswered. So when we talk about PSMA, we're really going to break it up into two different buckets. Number one is the use of PSMA as a diagnostic radiopharmaceutical, and the second is the use of PSMA as a theranostic radiopharmaceutical. And we would all agree that the journey is really continuing uh, right now, and it's really exciting. Obviously, the FDA approval of PSMA PET agents has been very exciting, and the impending FDA approval of PSMA Lutetium 177 uh, for treatment is also very exciting as well, uh, sparked by the, the vision data, uh, trial data that was presented at ASCO this year. So to talk about the use of PSMA in the diagnostic setting, the current state of the art is really using this tool to detect metastatic disease. And when we think about that, the current state of the art and what we're seeing its use most uh, frequently in is in patients who have biochemical recurrence following definitive therapy. And this might occur maybe in 30 to 50% of patients. And it's really created a renewed interest in this idea of oligometastatic disease and then METS-directed therapy in the setting of oligometastatic disease. Because theoretically, if you could diagnose metast oligometastatic disease with 100% accuracy and then treat those oligomets, you have a potential for cure. Obviously, that is, is very, very challenging, but we're, what we're seeing is that intervening in patients with oligometastatic disease with METS-directed therapy is showing some signal that it does have an improvement in some outcomes, such as delay to initiation of ADT or progression-free survival and endpoints such as that. So I think it's encouraging and exciting, and we're seeing the use of PET imaging, PSMA PET imaging, in this space grow. What we're also seeing is we're seeing a growth in the use of PSMA PET at initial staging. Uh, and, and the two PSMA agents that were approved actually have this uh, indication in their label to be used before prostatectomy or radiation therapy for initial staging. So that is slowly becoming state of the art. Under future diagnostic applications, I also include initial staging because to this point, we really don't have a great idea on how the use of PSMA PET upfront really impacts outcomes. And I think slowly we'll begin to learn more about that. And that's why I sort of included it both in the current state of the art and also in the future diagnostic applications. I think PSMA PET CT, uh, future diagnostic uh, applications will include the use of it for restaging patients and for documenting treatment response. But I think we need to learn more about this. Uh, before we could say that it needs or should be used for treatment response. And this picture from the uh, JNM article shows a great response to Lutetium 177 PSMA, and it shows how imaging can document that response. But you also see concordance with PSA, and PSA response is also good as well. So the question that I think we have to prove is, what additional value does imaging provide beyond uh, what PSA or other biomarkers might, might tell us to assess treatment response. And it's an exciting area, but it's something that I think we need to investigate much further before it's used routinely. Primary lesion characterization. I think using PSMA to define and better characterize the primary tumor is something that's exciting. There are studies out there that show that maybe it has a primary role in diagnosis. Maybe it has a complementary role to MRI for diagnosis. Some studies that are showing that you can correlate activity to Gleason scores. So all these areas are very interesting, but I think uh, not ready for prime time, but it's something that potentially with the right uh, studies will, is something that we can incorporate into the clinic. And prognosis is another area. A lot of times we, we use imaging for prognosis as a secondary benefit to, to imaging, but I think we really need to define the value of having that information. 
I agree, having information is wonderful, but we really need to be able to translate that into something um, that creates value uh, in the clinical care path. So now we're going to shift gears and, and look at PSMAs and Theranostics. And the current state of the art is for the therapies, the therapeutic piece, that lutetium 177 PSMA has a positive effect on outcome. And the vision trial, which we've heard about at this conference, is clearly showing that. And then when we think about the Gnostic part, the diagnostic part, how do we use imaging in, in that setting for Theranostics? It's really focused on patient selection. And patient selection, oftentimes we think of the use of PSMA PET to select our patients. And there's no doubt that makes a lot of sense. Uh, FDG to select patients is something that we're, we're learning more about as well. And this study from Mike Hoffman uh, called the Therapy Trial incorporated both PSMA plus FDG to select their patients. And it showed how it could be used to better select patients that would respond best to a lutetium or other type of uh, targeted radiopharmaceutical therapy. But there's also a question out there of whether or not imaging is required at all. Um, so Theranostics, is the Gnostics even needed? Maybe you could just treat patients with this therapy. And, you know, the vision trial, I believe 87% of those patients were PSMA positive. And that has led to some discussions about whether or not you need to treat some or uh, get a PSME pet up front to determine the value. And I think it's a valid question. I think it's something that we have to investigate. And I do believe there are trials out there that are actually treating some patients without having that PSMA PET up front. That being said, as an imager, uh, as a nuclear medicine radiologist, I believe that the imaging has a lot of value. And it's really leading into this transition of this idea of phenotypic precision medicine. And that's defined as observable characteristics that are produced through the interaction of a genotype and environment. And the PSMA expression is that observable characteristic on the PET that we're really focusing on with PSMA PET CT. PSMA PET has its advantages. So this idea of phenotypic precision medicine has a lot of advantages. Number one, it's non-invasive. So rather than having to get biopsies to get tissue to find the genotype, you have a non-invasive way of showing someone's phenotypic expression of a certain genotype and environment. You also get whole body assessment. So rather than just getting tissue or sampling one lesion, you can get a whole body assessment and really tackle the idea of heterogeneity. And that's important because we know heterogeneity exists and getting a total patient picture of how heterogeneous their disease is will, I think, unlock more clues into what patients will respond and what patients will not respond. And perhaps someday there'll be a pathway where you get lutetium 177 PSMA and some lesions will need to be radiated or maybe some lesions will be served surgically removed. I don't know, but I think this is very important to us taking that next step. And the semi-quantitative aspects of PSMA PET is also very appealing. The idea of being able to put quantitative parameters on the expression of this receptor. So therapeutic applications in the future, we're clearly seeing attempts at trying to move this treatment earlier. Uh, two trials come to mind. One trial looking at PS lutetium 177 PSMA in the castration resistance setting pre-chemotherapy, and then another trial called PSMA addition, looking at uh, the use of lutetium 177 PSMA in patients who are hormone sensitive with metastatic disease. Uh, and there's also a trial looking at uh, the use of lutetium 177 PSMA as an adjuvant treatment uh, called the lutectomy trial uh, before prostatectomy. I think all these trials are extremely exciting. And it's not surprising. I think a question that we'll have to answer is, you know, if we treat earlier and these patients live a lot longer, what about secondary malignancies? Uh, and it's something that I know people are looking at and will help us guide how early we can safely treat these patients. And the earlier we treat patients, the question of retreatment is going to come up. So the question becomes, how can we safely retreat patients in this setting? Combination trials are also very exciting. Given the mechanism of action of lutetium 177 PSMA 617, it makes sense that you might be able to combine it with immunotherapy or maybe combine it with a PARP inhibitor. And, and the LUPARP trial is one trial that's investigating that as well. Dose symmetry. Right now, we give empiric doses, or at least the trial gave empiric doses of PSMA uh, lutetium 177 
So this idea of dosimetry, being able to personalize these doses uh, conceptually makes a lot of sense. But I put a question mark there because we don't really have a great track record with personalized doses in nuclear medicine and that leading to an improvement in outcomes. So I, I think it's exciting. I think it needs to be looked at, but um, we need to study it more formally and actually prove the benefit. And then other types of therapies, you know, rather than using beta, beta emitters, uh, alpha particles are, are being actively investigated, uh, shows a lot of promise. And obviously alpha particles are particularly exciting because they are higher um, mass particles. They have higher linear energy transfer. They cause more DNA damage than a beta particle does. But they also have the potential to cause more side effects, adverse events. So that's something that we need to look at. And then the question becomes, once we might have a, an alpha particle that is approved, how do you sequence these drugs? Do you use a beta first and then an alpha? Or do you go straight to an alpha? You know, so sequencing within radiopharmaceuticals is a question that will have to be explored. And then obviously sequencing these radiopharmaceutical therapies in the context of all the other therapies that we have for these patients with metastatic disease is another question that we'll have to tackle. And I think nuclear medicine can be at the center of a lot of these trials. So some final thoughts. Lots of unanswered questions when it comes to uh, PSMA, uh, but clearly there's a lot of excitement and, and we've reached a milestone with regards to PSMA uh, used in the diagnostic setting and the therapeutic setting. The second point I'd like to make is that conventional wisdom or anecdotes are not evidence-based. That is not enough to change practice patterns. And it's something that we need to accept because we need to move forward. And moving forward, we really need to embrace clinical trials. The medical community requires it, the regulators require it, and the payers require it. So as a specialty, I think we really need to, to create robust clinical trials, train our, our, our physicians to, to be part, develop and be a part of clinical trials. And I think that'll really create meaningful changes in our specialty and really meaningful changes for patient care. And finally, I think this idea of disease site specialization within nuclear medicine is something that we need to move towards. Uh, it makes a lot of sense on a lot of levels um, and would love to speak more about that uh, in future discussions. So thank you very much for your attention.